right? It's still saying. No, it still like takes. Hey, there we go. Oh, we're now. Live. Hello. We're live. Hello. Hello. Good to see you all. Welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I'm Brandon Testers. I'm a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy. With me today, as always, is Cecil, wearing a unicorn uh, headphone. That, he's in a, he's still, he's, we're both in the office again today. Oh, my. Right. It's great for biking at night. <laughs> um, but Cecil is in a different location than he's been in the past. And that, I think that looks great. This is the first time I've seen that background. It looks nice, I think. Yeah. Um, he's out in our waiting room at the office outside that door. Anyway, hello. Here we are. Uh, Cecil and I together work uh, with our practice called Effective Artistry that does executive functioning, coaching, and therapy, um, individuals, groups, you know, families all kinds of whatever but what we're doing here is that every week we take an hour to just chat and talk about whatever people want to talk about who are here so for those of you who are here put questions thoughts comments whatever in the chat and uh we're here to have a conversation every week we pick a theme just to make it easier for us to like start a conversation before anybody throws anything out there but we don't have to keep talking about this thing. The people who are here get to dictate what it is that we're talking about. We'll go where the chat comments take us. But today's theme is sensory sensitivities. So we'll be talking a lot about sensation and perception. And I'm not even gonna try to promise not to get super philosophical and abstract today, because it's just gonna happen. We're talking about like how the brain interacts with physical data from reality. You know, it's, it's weird. Um, did I do all our normal logistical stuff? And then some, yes. <laughs> I will say, just to add, um, because this, you know, we started setting dates for this this morning. So we, we do a podcast in partnership with uh, Fusion Academy Oak Brook. Um, and we will be starting up season two of that August 18th. And what we'll be doing this go around as opposed to the first season is that we will be doing that as the live stream. So starting Wednesday, August 18th, and then for the, for the following 11 weeks after that, so 12 total weeks, uh, the live stream will be a podcast. We'll have other people here. It'll still be the same, you know, chat gets to chat and we talk about what chat wants to talk about, but we'll start with a topic, you know, the, the guest is going to be on. Um, so that'll be fun. Just letting everybody know that that'll be different and awesome. <laughs> um, anything else, Cecil? No, sorry. I'm distracted. All my toys and fidget stuff are in different locations, so I'm like grabbing them as we go. Sorry. <laughs> so I like reaching around. How like, dare you fidget with your fidgets? Cecil. Well, I didn't put them all in the places I want them yet, and so I'm like, ah. Yeah, good. Fidget with them. That's what they're for, literally. Uh, and it works into the topic today. Uh -oh. By switching into sitting crisscross out the sauce on my chair, I revealed that I'm wearing shorts instead of long pants because it's hot today. How scandalous. I hope people still think of me as a professional. Um, I love this chair because it's big enough for me to sit crisscross out the sauce. Yeah. Um, yeah, so sensory sensitivities. So we'll start here with just kind of a basic, you know, review of sensation and perception. So because we're going to use these words a lot today, probably. Sensation means that there is physical data in the environment that is detectable by your sensory organs, and those sensory organs are detecting that data. That's sensation. Then, after that, those sensory organs translate that physical data, whatever the organs are and whatever the data is, you know, varies based on what sense we're talking about. But then they take that data and they, they package it into uh, messages to send along the nervous system to the brain. And at that part, once it takes the physical data and starts translating it into data for the nervous system, that's where perception begins. It, it's fascinating and most people don't know this or think about this, but perception actually starts outside of the brain. It starts in the nervous system because as we talk about all the time, attention is a pre-conscious process you cannot consciously be aware of everything that's around you all the time. Uh oh, somebody's asking. Oh, it's my dad is asking. Is there sound? There should be sound. 
Um, if there's anybody else here, would you let us know whether you're hearing things? I hear you, Cecil, and you hear me. Yeah. And we're back in the office, so. Yeah, the internet shouldn't be an issue. No. Hopefully it's just on his end. Uh, well, if anybody else isn't hearing us, will you let us know? If there's more than one person, then obviously it's on our end. Yeah. Okay. Kid Squatch has sound. So cool. Somebody, somebody tell my dad that we all have sound and it's just. Him. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can do a thing. Like, oh, yeah. That's um, awesome. <laughs> So the consciousness, working memory, is finite space. There's only so much room for data in there. So there has to be a process that determines what data comes in and what does not. And that cannot be a conscious process because we would have to be consciously aware of all the data to be able to consciously decide which data to be aware of and which not. So obviously that's not the case. So it starts even in the nerves. Uh, so perception and sensation are two different things. So does that make sense so far? Who's not paying attention because you're typing things I told you to type. Uh -huh. Now, in that process, that attentional process of what comes into awareness and what does not, awareness working memory is about storage. Keep once the data comes into awareness, do I keep it? How long do I keep it before letting it go? You know, because I need that space for other things. Uh, but, but attention is the, the gatekeeper of does it enter into awareness in the first place, yes or no. And we do that by prioritizing. Some types of data are prioritized for various reasons, and so that comes in first. And the highest priority data comes in so that what's always happening all the time, just as a general universal rule, not general, universal rule, is there is more happening than we are aware of. That's just always true. So what we are aware of is shaped by our perceptive processes. And there are some elements of those processes that are at least relatively universal, maybe different in application, but universal in, in that they exist everywhere. So for example, novel data gets prioritized. Something new gets prioritized. Negative problematic data gets prioritized. The more problematic or painful it is, the more it gets prioritized. So basically it's this, the brain wants to stay alive more than pretty much anything else. And I know that there are obviously exceptions to this, but even in those cases, as best we are able to tell, because you can't talk to people who are successful, uh, that it is not an active, or at least does not appear typically to be an active desire for death, but rather a desire to escape whatever painful discomfort, you know, whatever thing. So the brain universally wants to stay alive. Again, some exceptions, but we're gonna stop acknowledging that every single time. <laughs> the brain wants to stay alive. So anything that threatens that is top priority. It doesn't matter what else you're doing, whatever you like, whatever you're enjoying. If all of a sudden data comes in that says, uh oh, this could kill me, that's gonna take priority. Now novel data gets priority in part at least, well, this is just my you know theory, but it makes sense, right? Because we don't know whether or not it's problematic. We don't have a, what we call a perception set to match it against. Meaning a perception set is my idea. My idea of what a cow is, is my perception set. And when I see something, I look for markers in that thing to match it against my perception set of cow. And if I see the right markers and match it as a cow, then I say, oh, great cow and I'm no longer seeing all the detail of the cow, I now just have, I see a cow. Like I'm not seeing the detail of every line on my face or Cecil's face, I just see Cecil or me or whatever, right? I see the data that's relevant. So until we have a perception set or until we're able to match it against the perception set, we don't know what it is and we wanna figure out what it is to make sure that it's not gonna be a problem for us. Uh, if it is a problem, then it's problematic data and we prioritize it for that reason. If it's not, oftentimes at that point, we just stop paying attention. New stuff is like, oh, interesting. And now I figured it out and now I no longer notice that thing. Now this all matters because the way that we find it useful at Effective Artistry to talk about sensory sensitivities, maybe I should give the default. Thing. In the future, maybe I should say like what the common description is before going into our thing. Nice. 
sensory sensitivities are generally talked about as that you are more sensitive to certain types of sensory data, like auditory, visual, tactile, olfactory. There are way more than five senses, by the way, like way more. That'll probably come up. We don't need to deal with it right now. Um, that if I have an auditory sensitivity, which I do a bit, not, not as extreme as others for sure, that loud noises might be more difficult or painful or uncomfortable for me than they are for other people. Does that make sense? If I have an olfactory sensitivity, then smells might be more bothersome. You know, problematic smells will be more problematic for me than for other people. This okay. is the general default definition. So it's only if it's problematic, not like... No. But that's usually how it's talked about. Okay. Usually when people are talking about sensitivities, they're talking about the ways in which those sensitivities are problematic. People who get overwhelmed by a sense okay. type of sensory data. The way that we find it more useful to talk about it is this, that in that attentional process, for whatever reason, and we can never know why exactly, we can come up with theories and whatever, but for whatever reason, your attentional process is prioritized data of that type disproportionate to its actual utility. And I know that's like a super like jargony, whatever, but what it means is this, if right now, I can hear the sound of cars and trucks going by on the road outside. I, that, that sensory data is hitting my ears. The sensation is there. But then because it's not relevant data to anything that I'm trying to do in the perceptive process, it gets bumped out. It's like, yeah, we don't need that. We don't, that information does not impact anything we're trying to do. It's not a problem for us, whatever. If it was too loud and I couldn't hear this, you know, then I would, it would be a problem. So when we're talking about sensory sensitivity, what we mean is even though that data does not have any apparent connection to anything that's relevant to me, I would bring it in anyway. It would take up room in my attention and in my awareness anyway, even though it's not necessary. So does that make sense? So disproportionate to whatever reason. And yes, that is a fuzzy boundary. <laughs> like how do we know what's relevant and what's not? Because that's part of what creativity is, is I'm picking up on data that other people say is irrelevant to the task, but then I utilize that data to accomplish this task. Mm -hmm. Well, it's creative. I came up with a new way because other people didn't know that data would be helpful. I feel like, I mean, Kid Squatch is saying, yep, it makes sense. He's still, you look confused. I don't know. No, just thinking about things because like, yeah. Like I, I'm like listening to music currently while we do this. Like I just have music on all the time, you know, so you know. So I'm just like thinking about that, so. Yeah, well, you have an auditory sensitivity. So fidgeting and stimming, that's you know where we started talking about fidgeting, right? Beautiful headphones, pass inside, says, that's nice, thank you. I'm saying thank you on season app, I don't know. Um, so our, our attentional processes do, humans are terrible generalizers. Maybe I should say fantastic generalizers that one thing happens and we apply whatever lesson we learned from that thing to like a bunch of stuff that in reality doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. You know, so I eat macaroni and cheese one time when I'm eight years old and I get sick and I hate the experience. And so now I'm like, nope, don't eat macaroni and cheese ever again because the, the brain is a cognitive miser. It's finite resources. Why bother with the nuance of, well, you know, what really made me sick that night when it's like, eh, I don't really care about mac and cheese anyway. I'm just going to say no more mac and cheese. That'll work. Right. No. So we don't want to spend resources that we don't need to when we do. Uh, so that that's where we generalize, right? Rather than if I'm, if for some whatever reason, sound is important to me, auditory data is important to me in some context, then I'm more likely to assume that auditory data is going to be important in all contexts. Okay. I'm getting into theory stuff. This doesn't really matter, but basically the why doesn't matter, but for whatever reason, we have categorized data by certain markers, like okay. the type of physical data it is, auditory, olfactory, et cetera. Or other things are like the way that that data is intended to be used, like receptive language and expressive language are categories of data. Social data is a category of data. And all of these are constructs that we're just making up 
with the exception of the sensory data, because there are physical, you know, a sound wave is different than I think smell is about like particles that attach to olfactory receptors, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also one of the earliest senses that we, that organisms developed was a sense of smell. It's really fascinating. But... It is fascinating. So when we prioritize that data in a way that seems disproportionate to us, that's when we call it a sensory sensitivity. So a classic example of this, because auditory sensitivity is what most people are, are most aware of. It's like the most commonly discussed one. So a classic example of this is we're in, you and I, we're all in a, a classroom and the fire alarm goes off because it's a fire drill. Now for everybody in that first moment of the fire alarm goes off, it's a piercing, it's a shrill sound. It is designed to be that so that you, your brain will say, oh crap, what the hell is this? You know, we are going to notice it. But then most people will pretty quickly say, oh, that's the fire alarm. And now the data is no longer useful to me, except to just monitor that it's continuing because if it stops, maybe that means I don't need to do whatever. But otherwise, I know it's the fire alarm. As long as it's continuing, I know what it is. I can focus on other things. And we'll still hear it because it is such a shrill and piercing thing. It connects to other things. The brain is going to prioritize that data, but not to the same extent where it's bump, like bumping everything else out. For a moment, it's only thing you're aware of basically is that fire alarm until you understand what it is. Then it takes up a smaller chunk of your awareness and you move on. Well, for some people, for whatever reason, when that fire alarm goes off, that first moment of, oh my gosh, like what just keeps going. It, it either doesn't get matched against the perception set so that I, you know, I keep needing to bring in more and more data and take up more room about it so that I can figure it out. Or even though it's matched against a perception set, it's still, you know, again, we don't know why. But for some people, if the fire alarm is going, they're not functioning. All of us don't function for a moment in the yeah. various lengths of time, you know, that we all need to process and understand what that is. But for some people, that's very drawn out. And all of their sounds all day, every day, yeah. Now, that's like the basic description of what it is. Yeah? Okay. Fair? Then we can talk about how it affects you or, you know, what to do about it or whatever. But I also want to make it clear that at any point, people can put questions and we can get off onto some other thing or more detailed about this or more specific and practical rather than just kind of the larger definitions or whatever. So I know that we talk a lot about like it being problematic in the sense of like if someone has an auditory sensitivity and they hear the fire alarm, um, they're non-functional, which is the problematic word. But um, so there's that. But what about like what do you do in your daily life? Like like when I I mean, you know how it is with me, like I always want to have music on. Um, so like, what does that do? Like, I feel more productive or I'm able to do more with music on. Is that like a legit thing or is that just like a, I know, no, I know that's. It like, is definitely legit. And I'll be real clear that here we're about to get into like, you know, what I was just saying is, is the science. It's what we collectively know with like some of my like personal language and spin put on it. But what we're about to get into is just like pure brand and theory. Maybe other people know or talk about it in this way, which if anybody knows of that, awesome, tell me because I don't know of it, but it's not like I did a thorough search. So just take that for what it's worth. Here's my theory on, on call it fidgeting, stimming, whatever, is the brain prioritizes problematic data. Even like you just said, right? We focus on talking about sensitivities when they cause problems, not when they're beneficial. Mm -hmm. Because theoretically they must be beneficial sometimes there must be some utility to it or why would a brain do it right if it, unless it was injury or illness or something um so we we prioritize remembering things that are negative if, if there are a hundred things in my field of view and three of them might kill me my attentional process is going to make sure that those three get noticed and if other stuff also gets noticed great but if not we're going to make sure that those three things get noticed so we can do whatever we need to do, right? So we prioritize problematic data, meaning if something is painful or uncomfortable or whatever, you're more likely to notice it than if it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. How often do you notice air temperature when the air temperature is comfortable? 
How often do you notice it when it's really hot or really cold? How often do you notice how your throat feels when it's not sore versus when it is sore, right? We, we want our resources free, so we only spend them where there's something bothering us, right? So here's my theory, <laughs> is if we have a sensitivity, which means that we are prioritizing that data disproportionate to the reason behind it. In other words, that music is not relevant to any task that it is that you were trying to do, right? Well, that means that if it comes into awareness, it doesn't need to stay there. When I fidget, this is my most common fidget now, is my, my fancy little pen that I bought. Uh, when I fidget, this tactile data, and there's auditory data to it as well, there's a little, like, little bit of a click. Oh, my mic's here. You're like, oh, everyone see the click? <laughs> <laughs> um, this data is not problematic for me. So if I'm aware of it, which I am right now, then I don't need to store it in awareness because it's not a problem. It's also not relevant to solving any problem that I am currently having. So it doesn't need to stay into awareness for that reason. I, brought, I define problem a little bit differently than most people might, but the way that I define it, the brain only holds in awareness three things, three types of data, novel data, so I don't know if it's problematic or not, problematic data, or data that I believe will help me or could potentially help me in resolving a problem. And this is none of those things. It's not novel. I've done it a million times. It's repetitive. Your music, it's not novel. Even if you do sometimes have new songs playing, which I'm guessing you probably don't have that often, just the concept of listening to music. It's not novel, it's not problematic, and it's not relevant to um, solving a problem, or at least I don't believe that it is. But if I have a sensitivity, then it is admitted into awareness through, it comes through attention and gets into awareness because the whole point of a sensitivity is that it prioritizes data and allows it into awareness disproportionate to the relevance of that data. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you think of attention as a pipe, you know, bandwidth, if some portion of that pipe is taken up by music coming into awareness, but then as soon as it gets into awareness, you let it go because it's not relevant. If that music isn't there, something else is taking up that space in attention and is coming in. And that something else might be problematic, might be novel, might be potential solution data. And so you don't let it go right away. So in other words, fidgeting or stimming in a sense, is a way to free up awareness space. It enables you to focus more on whatever task it is that you're doing because there's more room in there to get into this further because I've got this clicky data coming in that goes right out again as opposed to if I didn't have this data taking up the space, I might notice like the people walking by and that's more interesting. It's an interesting this kind of goes with like to the comments, um, like Bass Insider says like music helps uh, helps me a lot, I was putting it up here so you can see. Helps me a lot, but I feel like it's 6% of a mood booster and 4% of a, what you would call helpful distraction. Something that takes up enough of your brain to help you focus, which, yeah, like, that's how I feel. Um, yeah. I and, then, and like, um, which like follows with Kids Quatch's statement, like, um, when my husband's watching uh, TV, my brain says it's problematic, which I struggle with, like, because like, you know, I talk about music, but I like to have noise, I guess is a better way of looking at it. And when I'm sleeping, if it's like, my partner's like watching a new show or something, it's very hard for me to like fall asleep. But if it's familiar, it's like, I, I like having that sound on if it's something that I'm familiar with, opposed to something I'm unfamiliar with. Yeah. Well, there's so. that. And there's more categories than just what is the physical source of the data. In other words, language is a category so I might prioritize language, so I don't want, this is very common actually with people who do like to listen to music for this reason. I don't want language, I don't want lyrics. I want instrumental music because lyrics will draw my focus because I respond to that language data differently. So on your TV, or if your partner's watching TV, if there's words being spoken, that might draw your focus. Whereas if he was watching something that just had background music, it wouldn't bother you, even if it was novel. 
Potentially, you can experiment with it. Uh, also, with with auditory in particular, and this is definitely not my area of expertise, but you know, Cecil knows about this better than me. But with auditory in particular, sound waves do mess up other sound waves. So there could be an element there as well where the music is physically kind of blocking other sounds from you, not just in perception. If that makes sense. Yes, I hate noise canceling stuff. Um, that sound of the noise canceling, like, it's hard for me to deal with. <laughs> so, but um, yes, yeah, so I'm looking at these comments. Yeah, like, best center is like, go ahead, put, put this one up there. Um, H rocks, like, I like their comment, um, kind of pay back what you said, but this one too is, um, is there a better word for that? Uh, I work best in the coffee shops because there's just enough background stuff together uh, with a little bit of novelty in a different location. I mean, like, so a couple of things, one real quick for that Atrox comment where uh, they're asking, is it like, is it drawing a barrier between you and unnecessary input? I would say that it's actually the opposite. It's that it itself is the unnecessary input and it is blocking you from picking up other things that might be relevant and therefore would need to take up space in your awareness, be stored as opposed to quickly evaluated as, oh, yep, this does not matter, go away. And I wanna talk about video games in this too, Cecil, so remember that if I forget. Okay. Um, is there a better word for that? Not really right now. Usually people refer to this, so there's fidgeting and there's stimming. Those two words are used to more or less, in, in, in the way we're defining it, to more or less mean a very similar thing but they're used in very different contexts. So usually stimming is used to refer to behaviors that autistic people engage in. And some people will be very strict about their definition of what counts as stimming. In fact, like the official DSM definition is about repetitive physical gestures. So commonly things like hand flapping or rocking back and forth, things like that. I know Cecil. <laughs> things that Cecil does. It's almost like many of us are autistic but without official diagnoses. Um, and fidgeting is used more to refer to people with ADHD and tends to be used to refer more to things that are, you know, tactile data. But some people will then broaden it out and say no. Like for example, singing, vibration is one of my fidgets, including, by the way, speaking as someone that you all know, like likes to talk, finds enjoyment in talking, both in that the way that it vibrates my body, that tactile data. So I'm one of those people that is constantly humming and will be humming something and be like, where did I hear that? Oh, that was in the store three hours ago and I've just been humming it on a loop for three hours. Right? <laughs> so different people will say different things, but to me, I think this is the most helpful way to say it is just any data that is not novel not problematic and not potentially solutions, but that you notice anyway, especially if you are consciously doing something to bring it in. But a lot of times we don't. The leg bouncing, right? I don't consciously choose to do. I might not even notice that I'm doing it, but it is something that correlates with a lot of this. Yeah, well, there's more to the talking to self too. Wait, I missed some comments. Uh, I like so there's also processing, which is a separate thing from perception. And audit so auditory processing is a very big deal for a lot of us. And it is different than sensation or perception. It's about being able to distinguish and match those things against perception sets separate from other things. And it's about um, efficiency. How much time, how much energy, how much focus does it take you to do those things? If I tell you right now, Cecil, listen to my words so that you can repeat them verbatim, you can put more effort to that and you will hear and remember every word. But if I don't do that, generally you're not gonna hear and process every word. You're just gonna get enough for the brain to say, yeah, yeah, I get what he's saying. Uh, in the context of ADHD, music, a spinner, allows for better focus, I need to distract my brain. So yes, those things can allow for better focus. Now, it's not universal. A fidget, fidget spinners, by the way, are not, I don't like them as fidgets, but you know, to each their own. Um, now I want to get distracted on this like cultural thing. Because part of what happens is that there is enough 
cultural awareness about fidgets and that people with ADHD benefit from them without any context. Nobody knows why, but it's a very common accommodation in school IEPs and 504s and things for people with ADHD is to allow them to have a fidget. So they're allowed to have something to play with. That's great, but nobody really knows why they're supposed to be theoretically helpful. And so then some people started getting in on, oh, how can we use this concept of a fidget to basically give somebody a cool toy to play with? And I think that is a big part of what the fidget spinner is. In the, in the context of school accommodations, the best fidgets are, for me, things that can be done underneath your desk, things that can be done in one hand, things that don't make noise, because, you know, that can be distracting people, et cetera. But, you know, everybody's different and different things work for different people. Uh, yes, it does allow for better focus. Also important in this, eye contact. Sometimes people will be able to hear your words, pay much better attention to the conversation if they are not looking at you. And forcing them to look at you actually overloads their brain in a way that makes it very difficult for them to carry on the conversation. We have a cultural rule that eye contact is respectful how do I know if you're listening to me, if you're not looking at me, et cetera. And some of that makes sense. How do I know? But then we just explain, oh, just so you know, I listen better when I'm not looking. I'm, I'm still listening to you. I just can't look at you. And again, we can do those other things. You can go without your fidget. You can make eye contact, but it reduces efficiency and the brain wants to be efficient. It doesn't want to spend resources it doesn't need to do. I need to distract my brain. Oh, here's one. And I'm throwing this out there because that's my dad asking the question and I know him and I know myself and snacking is absolutely a fidget. I need some stimulation. I'm going to just crunch on things for a while. I'm bored. When I sit in front of the TV, I'm probably snacking. If I wasn't sitting in front of the TV, I wouldn't feel hungry. I wouldn't be eating. I just, it's just a way of getting some stimulation. Now I got to catch up on some of these comments. I love this. Like, this, like there's a one real fast from Best Insider. They're about to leave, so I want to okay. pop this one up. Let's do this one. Oh, uh, really quickly. I worry that lack of fidgeting means I'm less likely to have ADHD, but then I think um, I might just fidget differently. In tactile stuff, I'm more likely to want to process. Yeah. Thanks for being with us, and goodbye. And if you're still hearing this. Fidgeting has nothing to do with whether or not you have ADHD. I mean, it's a very complicated thing, but fidgeting, again, some people will define only as tactile, but yeah, the, you're talking about listening to music, you're fidgeting with music. Echolalia, if anybody, echolalia is repeating sounds that you hear, you know, making your voice repeat sounds that you hear in particular language uh, can, can be a form of fidgeting. Uh, people who, pick up on other people's accents unintentionally, right? When you talk to someone and you start mimicking their way of speech, that's that can be a sign of neurodivergence because you're prioritizing data that other people would say is not relevant, right? Like, I know this person is from X place. I no longer need to notice their dialect any more than is necessary for me to understand what they're saying. But some of us hear the sound of it, not just the word of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Like I know. So my son, my five-year-old. Oh, here, here's a story about your grandson, Dad. My five-year-old um, is very into Star Wars, and he is very imaginative and likes creative play and likes to make up stories. So he'll be characters, and he'll tell me to be characters. And we do all kinds of voices for all different kinds of things. And one he's been doing a lot lately is clone troopers from Star Wars, which is a New Zealand accent, kind of a modified, but mostly a New Zealand accent. And we were playing. And at one point he goes, we've got to get to the biddle. And I said, what? Biddle, biddle? And he said, and so he had to come out of the voice and say battle. And I was like, oh, because in my head, when I'm doing the voice, I would have said battle. We've got to get to the battle. But he said biddle. And then I had to say it both ways. Battle, biddle, battle, biddle. I don't know which one is the right way. <laughs> like, I don't know which one matches it. But we're just picking up on detailed data about the sound past the language, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I don't use music as a stim, as a fidget, um,
because I don't process musical information that way. Either I'm paying attention to it or I don't notice it at all. Yeah, clone troopers. I spent some time this morning looking for. No, the best thing, this is a total sidetrack, but it actually is not in a sense. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things is that because it's about auditory processing and it's about schema and whatever, because everything is. But like I'll be, I'll say to my son, his name is Miles. I'll be like, Miles, Miles, I need you to come over here, Miles. And he won't respond. And then I'll go, Troopa, I need you over here. And he'll be like, Yes, sir. And he comes right over. <laughs> and it's not, it's or at least it's not always or not completely a matter of I don't care to respond until you do it in a way that I enjoy more. It can be about processing that I am not processing that data in the same way. One of the most common ways that people initially get assessed for autism and ADHD, but autism in particular, is not responding to their parents calling their names, right? That, wait, my three-year-old, I'm saying like, hey, Miles, 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 and he's not looking at me, what's going on? And they go get it checked out, is his hearing okay? No, the hearing's okay. And so then we go into auditory processing and oftentimes that leads people down the path to diagnosis as autistic or ADHD. If ADHD sometimes is because what they're saying is, yeah, he hears it, he's just not paying attention, which is not incorrect necessarily, but not it's in the inaccurate. way people it. Right. Usually people mean like he doesn't care enough to pay attention mm -hmm. and that's not the case. And again, he might be getting the auditory data but then not processing it as language to make sense, to get the meaning from the language, even though he's getting, because auditory data sensation is just physical stuff in the environment. Meaning is when something is connected to something in our long-term memory that it pulls up. So sound doesn't have meaning, but once we perceive it, once we understand it, match it against the perception set, now it has meaning, it's connected to all these different things. You know, people will say hearing is different than listening, right? Because it is. Oh, here's a super common one. Could be hyper-focusing on things. Yes, absolutely. That that can be part of it. And it can also be that sometimes they hear you and just don't want to stop doing what they're doing. I'm not saying it's never that. I'm just saying it's not only that. Um, here's one is when we use things to buy ourselves time, right? Somebody asks a question that I hear just fine, but I'll say, what? Because while they're repeating themselves, I'm processing what I heard them say the first time. And before they finish repeating themselves, I figured out what I said. So now I respond to the question. And a lot of times people will get annoyed at that. Like, why did you say what if you heard me? <laughs> like, yeah. You asked me to go through this process of repeating myself and you answered before I finished it. So obviously you heard me. It's just, we need time to process sometimes. So what about like other types of um, sensory sensitivity? And like, you know, so we, uh, you know, it's easy to like tell if you have an auditory sensitivity for whatever reason, but like, what are the ones that like are less common or less, like, like, less discussed? Yeah. And the reason I ask that is because like, like being more aware of like my auditory sensitivity, like helps me like create an environment that's like, I can be more yeah. focused in and it can be like really beneficial for me. So like, what else is there then? Well, the, you know, the full answer is... Oh, here's like, kids watch, she's like, oh. Yeah, light sensitivity. So I was going to say that the, the full complex answer is it can be a sensitivity to anything because we can categorize it in different ways. Now we're doing sensory sensitivity, so we're keeping it through sensation. That's why we're not talking as much about like language or social data and whatever sensitivities. But, excuse me, light sensitivity is in a sense... So now I should say, I'm sure that there are other components of this that I don't know about. Like there may be something medically happening that means that your body or your brain responds to light in a different way. Um, especially when we're talking about light sensitivity, because I really don't have a lot of information at all about things like epilepsy and photosensitive people and that kind of stuff. But I'll say that if we think of visual sensitivity as a thing, right, I prioritize visual data disproportionate to what it is, you know, what reason, what utility it holds for me. Well, light is going to be the most noticeable part of that because 
be like, oh, there's so it's so bright. There's so much light in here. But the other question to ask yourself is, if there's a lot of clutter in your visual view, like in your field of view, does that overwhelm you? Does that make it difficult? Do you like minimalism? Do you like to keep spaces clean and clear and big, wide, empty, open? You know, I need not a lot going on because that could be visual sensitivity too. Yeah, light sensitivity. So, ooh, and thank you for saying, Kitschquatch says, it, it drains me. Yeah, that's a very important part of this is that these sensitivities, it's resource expenditure. Now, sometimes when we're talking about like fidgeting and stimming, uh, fidgeting, stimming stuff, then, then that's when we're utilizing it on purpose, right? We want that data to come in, especially when we're talking about like overwhelm or in autistic people, you know, the language of using it, calling it a meltdown often. But basically when we're overwhelmed in one way or another, we're emotional or we're panicking or whatever, and we want other data to come in, then stimming or fidgeting can help with that. Because even though I'm so focused on this thing, well, I am sensitive to this stuff. So I will notice it anyway, which decreases, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, there is a cost. Anything that you find draining, no, let me say it this way. Everything that every person does every moment takes something from you right? That anything you are conscious of, even for just a moment, takes some of your time, some of your energy, some of your attention, some of your working memory. Now, when we talk cost and value, it's because we spend those things, we are drained for things that have value to us, theoretically. When we spend things on things that are not valuable to us, which does happen, that tends to be when people use the term drain. Either that or that it's like a low level of expenditure over a long period of time that people will talk about drain. But I'm just making guesses here. All it means is, yeah, it's taken some of your resources. If you don't like what you're spending your resources on, then that's a problem because getting energy back or, you know, it's reductive is, is based in large part on enjoyment. So if I'm spending energy on things that aren't enjoyable and not getting things out of it in the moment, even if it's worth something later on, then I'm going to be pretty drained. But I, I love my work. I love my job. And at the end of the day, when I go home, often I will not process language very well at all. After doing the way that I do this work, the amount of data that I am processing moment to moment with somebody, that what I'm hearing that they don't even hear themselves, right? It takes a lot. And so then at the end of the day, sometimes I just don't have that left. And my wife will get frustrated sometimes because talking about kids, it will be Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. Hmm? What? <laughs> you know? Or just, you know, my kid asking me a question. And I'm like, uh, uh. so spending resources is spending resources. We just, if it's not on things we like, then it really is a problem. Again, especially with the light stuff, there may also be like other medical things that I'm not aware of. We're just talking about this element of it. Well, I like the idea of like being aware of sensory, sensory sensitivities and like in a way that's like, oh yeah, not just because they're a problem, avoid things that are a problem, but like, you know, curating your environment to set you up for success. I mean, this kind of goes into the whole idea of like what special needs are, which there isn't a thing special needs because everyone has special needs, every single person. Um, but our system is set up needs is bad language yeah it's yeah unhelpful um but like accommodations yeah, just, but in, in case anybody's wondering accommodations is what we would talk about if we're talking when when people say special needs in reference to what the needs are we would call those accommodations if someone's saying special needs in relation to a person we call that person disabled just to offer the replacement language if we're going to tell people that that's bad go ahead cecil okay cool um but like be able to like you know, build your environment or cultivate your like work environment or home environment or whatever in a way that like is, you know, such a for success as opposed to like being a struggle. Cause it's like, you know, Kiss Crunch talks about the light. Like, I assume it's the light in the office, it drains them or it drains her. But yeah, like you would just say that you would never pay attention to. And also, like, you change those things and like things could be so much easier <laughs> for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, we don't want, you want resources. 
it's not that the brain doesn't want to spend resources. It's that the brain wants to spend resources on things that matter. So if you don't have enough prioritized stuff, then you move down the list. You will find something. This is a big part when we were talking about sleep of what can happen for people at night is you have curated that environment theoretically. You have made it so that it's a comfortable temperature and you know there's not much light and you know whatever things you like and need. And so then the brain's like, oh, good. We, we don't have to focus on any of this stuff so we can work on oh, yeah. priority number 40 that we don't normally have time for. Yeah. Um, but like, it's just like the idea that um, we have an appointment I'll put it there. Um, when you have an appointment in someone's uh, somebody's office, or have to be in a store with music of commercials playing, yeah, um, I have headphones every almost everywhere I go. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and that's it. Or wear sunglasses, right? That can help as well. Yeah, the brain yeah. gets confused because there's so much data. It's like. For whatever reason you're prioritizing that data so you are noticing it and it's overwhelming and it's distressing this is a little complicated but basically anything that we're aware of we don't want to be aware of it we want that free so we're trying to resolve it all as quickly as possible so in some sense discomfort is just being aware of a thing comfort is not being aware of a thing what's a comfortable air temperature the temperature at which i don't notice it what's a comfortable sitting surface the sitting surface that I don't notice. If I notice it, it's not comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, in one sense, we want to design our environments to be as comfortable as possible because it frees up resources to do other things. But just like with the sleep stuff, sometimes that backfires depending on what strategies you use to solve other problems because sometimes we solve problems by just deprioritizing them and being like, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I don't like it, but you know, it's not a big deal, or I don't like it, but there's nothing I can do about it or whatever. So then when we free up all that comfort, now all of a sudden we're back down to these problems and it's like, oh shit. <laughs> I mean, crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, this is, as far as the utility of, of talking about sensitivities, I think is primarily two or three things. Number one is what you're talking about, Kid Squatch, is, oh, Rather than think of myself as deficient in a way that I can't be around bright light, think of it as my brain prioritizes that data and I need to be aware of that. Now, other people might think it's weird for me to wear my sunglasses inside, but if I have the language to understand what it is that I'm experiencing, this is part of what can be so helpful about diagnosis, for example, even though diagnosis is an imperfect system. Once I get language to be able to explain to others why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? That if if you are somebody who believes that eye contact is respectful and not making eye contact is disrespectful, well, then I'm going to force myself as much as I need to in order, you know, depending on who you are, to look at you, even though it's bad. But if I have the language to explain to you in a way that you will understand and agree with that I'm looking away in, or because of how much I prioritize listening to you, that I would rather listen to you then give you a sign of respect that actually makes it difficult for me to listen to you. That's how much I value your words. Even though I'm worried that you might think I'm being a jerk by not looking at you, I'm taking that risk because I wanna hear what you're saying. Then all of a sudden that person might not care so much. Or if we're wearing sunglasses inside and somebody's like, hey, take off your sunglasses, you weirdo. And we can say, well, actually I have a light sensitivity. So this makes it easier for me to be in this environment. Now, some people are gonna be jerks about it, but some people might not. And even the jerks, if you had the right language, if you knew exactly what they thought about this and that and what words meant what, theoretically you could get them to understand. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. It just matters your perception of what they'll do. Yeah. There's that question here. It's like, do transition lenses help or possibly uh, prescriptions and glasses for like light sensitivity? I mean, my two cents on that is like, try it and see. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know, maybe. I, I want to know. Try it and let us know. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. I want that information. Um, yeah, generally it's about either give your brain. So, so oh, we were talking about utility. So that's one is having the language to be able to engage in the things that help you and that you know help you. But now you have some language to describe why. Not actually knowing why because it's infinitely complicated, but enough of it to be able to share with somebody else so that you can engage in doing those things. Or even if you don't, 
you might be more comfortable wearing sunglasses because you know, because you have the language to understand why you're doing it. And that if other people are still judging you, you might be able to say like, well, they just don't know. I, this is what I need. It's how I'm comfortable, whatever. Yeah. So there's that. Then there's the fidgeting, stimming part of it, which is find yourself sources of that kind of data that are not novel, not problematic, and not relevant as potential solutions, just repetitive data. Also good to know, by the way, because people might not, getting heightened emotion, whether it's good or bad, often provokes that stimming and fidgeting response. You know, happy hands is a term a lot in the autism community where you can be feeling really great and then jump and flap hands or whatever, because it's still an overwhelming experience. Um, but so um, just like going back to like this is like um, how to identify your sensory sensitivities. Like well, what are you- As always, we start with the same thing always, observe what is happening and what's been happening. Oh, last sentence, please. What? Uh, we have a delay between the when they stream, so like we're like I think twelve seconds ahead of them. So maybe the part where yeah. I was saying having the language in your head to describe it to yourself can still change how you feel about your perception that other people are judging you, because if you say, "Well, this is what I need because of my light sensitivity," then you can take pride in that. Sometimes this works for people, right? To be like, no, I'm doing what I need to do to take care of myself. Screw those people for not understanding. Whereas if you don't have that language, sometimes it's like, oh, I am weird. Why am I weird? So that can be helpful. I don't know if that's the sentence that you were asking about. I'm sorry, the delay makes it hard for me to know. Oh, oh, about what starts talking. The, the uh, heightened emotional state can prompt fidgeting or swimming even if it's good emotions, even if it's excitement or happiness, it can still be so much. Think about happy tears, right? Like we're having a, a physiological response that is similar to what we would be feeling if we were, but only at a very intense emotional state. So intense happiness or intense sadness, both can result in tears. Same thing with stimming or fidgeting. It can be distress or excitement. Joy or distress, I guess, would be the opposites. So it's just, it, it's a regular, uh, um, regulatory behavior. And when we're talking about, especially with autistic people, when we're talking about things like quote unquote meltdowns, but when we talk generally about prefrontal cortex shutdown that everybody experiences to one degree or another, that that is a distressing situation and we need regulatory behavior, regulatory strategies to engage in, to prevent us from getting to that. We have those things that we develop naturally. We'll come back to that's why we start by observing, but we can also specifically design those things too. But now imagine what happens for somebody when you remove their regulatory behavior from them, when you tell them they can't fidget, keep your hands still, or they can't rock, or they can't sing, or they can't whatever. And now they're in distress because the things that they normally would do in order to decrease, to regulate, they're not able to do unless they violate whatever social custom or you know disappoint whoever is enforcing the rule or whatever, which comes with its own distress until we cannot control it anymore. So all of us have an experience, have had experiences, maybe I shouldn't say all of us, I assume this is all of us, but maybe I'm, I don't know, where like you're crying, but you know you could stop if you really wanted to. If it was important enough to, you could make yourself stop. But there's also an experience of I'm crying and I couldn't stop it even if I really wanted to, right? So if we're not allowed to engage in those regulatory behaviors, well, that just means that we're kind of going, we're in that window of I would otherwise be crying, but I'm stopping myself because it's important. You know, I would otherwise be doing X thing, but I'm stopping myself to... And eventually, unless the source of that distress changes, we're going to hit that point where it's, nope, I can no longer, I no longer have the option. It is now involuntary for me to do whatever thing I need to do to regulate or, or whatever. Okay, so go back to the, 
um, identifying your sensory sensitivities? Start with observation and just put together patterns. Here's the big and easy thing and not easy, simple, simple, not easy, is look at all the things that you do that other people have pointed out that you do that you might not necessarily notice yourself that you do until they point it out. The leg bobbing is, you know, one of those, right? Grinding teeth, um, humming, fidgeting, whatever. Behaviors that you engage in regularly and other people point out, because that's clue number one, is that if other people wouldn't point it out if it was something that they also did. They are seeing it as notable. So if people point it out to you, that means that it's somewhat unusual, even if it's just to that person. But if a lot of different people point it out to you in a lot of different contexts, that's more and more flags that this is something I'm doing that's different from the skin picking. Yes, absolutely. There's a reason that ADHD, people with ADHD are more likely to pick their skin. Um, really, when you shift to thinking about it this way, well, okay, I'll get to the second part. So, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, people have found it notable and you do it without noticing it yourself, but you do it repeatedly. Then here's step two. Start looking at the physical components of the things that you are doing. We generally don't do this. We generally, when we're saying like, I'm having a hard time writing this paper, don't think about maybe there's something about the physical element of typing the keys that is involved in that difficulty. We generally jump to, oh, I can't write it because some psychological reason or some intellectual reason, and we skip over the physical. Like music, right? Cecil, now you would say that that music, you have a sensitivity or whatever, you know, you'd use that language now. But even two years ago or whatever, before we started talking about these things, you would have just said, I like music. And if people asked you why, you probably had psychological or intellectual reasons why and ignored the physical aspect. If you have a hard time, for example, making lists, it is entirely possible that there's an element of the physical act of writing or the physical act of attaining and processing that data that's the problem, not that you just don't like reading. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so as you're observing these behaviors, and one of the ways is to think about what have people pointed out, then start looking at what physical components do they have. So another really common one, people will talk about a correlation between ADHD diagnosis and skateboarding that people will talk about oh skateboarding and they'll and when you ask why we notice a pattern people with adhd disproportionately seem to be into skateboarding compared to the you know normative population when you jump to why people are going to jump to a psychological or an intellectual reason what do you think people will say when you say why do adhd people like skateboarding cecil or anybody um because because it's an activity they like. <laughs> a very common answer for people who are trying to say why is because of the culture of it. Because people who skateboard are outside the norm and ADHD people are outside the norm. And so there's comfort in being around people like that. And there's truth to that. I'm sure there is. I was just thinking because like back in the day that they were all, those are like the boys I went for. So that's <laughs> so, like, so like you guys were. <laughs> yeah, well, now you know. You are. <laughs> physical or tactile <laughs> no skateboarding involves a lot of vibration vibrating the body singing also does this uh humming you know speaking and it involves a lot of uh balance so what we're talking about is proprioception and vestibular senses okay so when you are skateboarding ask ask if you know somebody who has adhd and they like to skateboard ask them about it or how about this? Ask any artist how they feel when they're doing their art. Ask anybody how they feel when they're engaging in the things that they most love to do. And you will usually get a response that's something like, my mind just turns off. I stop thinking. I get clarity. It feels like I'm flying. It feels like I'm on autopilot. It feels like I, or peak experiences, Maslow's peak experiences, or the other people will call flow or um, being in the zone, right? Athletes. You ask them what's happening out there. I'm not thinking. Famously in The Last Samurai, as Tom Cruise's character is learning to sword fight, they're saying you have too many minds, you're thinking about too much, stop thinking. So what we mean is 
Oh boy, this is a whole big thing. Skip, skip, skip. What's the important part? What it, what we mean is is pulling your awareness to the present physical environment as opposed to the cognitive environment. Awareness is finite and it encompasses both sensation, perception that originates in sensation and cognition. So the more we're thinking, the less we're observing our real environment. And vice versa, the more we're observing our real environment, the less we're thinking. This is why meditation and mindfulness, things that are like, hey, and they can go either way. Mindfulness is almost always about engage with the environment. Meditate, meditation sometimes is about engaging with the environment. Sometimes it's the opposite, disconnect from the environment to free up space for cognition. But yeah, people who constantly have thoughts running and are overwhelmed and then go skateboarding and those thoughts go away or they get on stage and those thoughts go away. It's like, oh, this is great. And we jump to the psychological, like, oh, I love performing because et cetera, this what. And we lose track of like, no, I am picking up on data, processing data in a way where everything I'm detecting is useful and I use it immediately. So it clears out my awareness right away. And skateboarding moment to moment, I am bringing in all that data about balance and torque and momentum and vibration and whatever, because if I don't, I'll fall but I use that data autonomically in the moment. So it, nothing is staying in my awareness moment to moment. It's all new data that is coming out as fast as it's coming in. And there's a feeling to that. And we call it being in the zone or whatever, but we like it because we like having our resources freed up. Well, that's our time for today. Thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for all your comments and everything. Um, I got to put the last little bit on Okay. It examine the physical elements of those behaviors and then look for patterns in the physical elements. Are these behaviors, do they all involve touching? Do they all involve vibration? Do they all involve sound? Do they all involve scent, right? When some people swear to you that a scent diffuser does make them sleep better, it likely does. That doesn't mean it's universal. Anyway, so that's notice the behavior, look at the physical element, put together patterns. Cool. Go ahead. Sorry. Awesome. No, no worries. Uh, that's it for this week. Um, we'll be back next week at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time for another This Is Not Therapy Hour. Um, until then, um, feel free to reach out to us at uh, on Twitter or Instagram or just email us. Um, it's at EF underscore artistry. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you we'll be back next week. Thank you all.